Today's episode of the Riderflex podcast is sponsored by our friends at Colorado Startups. Their mission is to connect startups with needed capital and talent to build industry-changing companies in Colorado. They are the largest online community of founders in the state and a great resource for local entrepreneurs building a big company. And on today's episode of the Riderflex podcast, we have guest Teresa Elder. She's the CEO of Wide Open West, or better known as WOW. They are the sixth largest cable operator in the United States. The company offers landline telephone service, cable television, and broadband internet services. Thank you. Okay. All right, cool. You ready to roll? Sure. How's my hair look? Does it look, do I need to comb in or anything before we start? You got the same hairdo my husband does. Really? Okay. Yeah. Good look. <laughs> Teresa Elder on the Rider Flex podcast. How you doing, Teresa? Doing well this morning. Thanks. I love that that background, that office. Is that your home office? Sure is. Now, what is that? Is that a little statue or trophy behind you? What is that? I can't quite tell. It, what is that? It's not a trophy, but it's something very meaningful to me. Thanks for asking. It's actually a bronze statue of a little girl who uh, passed away many years ago from cystic fibrosis. And um, her parents are dear friends and mentors of mine. And uh, so it's very meaningful. So um, I like keeping her nearby. Awesome. Wow, that's super special. I want to get into some of that stuff. I know that's part of, part of your family history. Why don't you start with where you grew up, family, mom, dad, siblings, just walk us through some, some personal history. Sure. Uh, I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I grew up there. I'm the youngest of four. Uh, my parents uh, were wonderful parents, and my mother was a teacher. My father did uh, logistics, both for the government and then for a company uh, later on in his career. So had a great life there and uh, actually went on to college there, went to Creighton University and uh, met my husband there. And oh. then uh, we moved on and have lived many places since. So that's why you chose Creighton. I was wondering. I didn't know if you grew up there. And okay, okay, gotcha. I did. Now- I grew up there, and my husband was in law school when I was an undergrad. So how did you meet? Was this at a party? Was this at a social gathering? Was it at a, at a football game? Or you like, tell me, I want to know how that worked. Did he see you and like, hey, well, what's your well, name? He doesn't or- have a football team, but no, it, uh, there are a lot of you know, uh, of course big football in Nebraska, that's for sure. We actually met uh, at a restaurant where I was the hostess and he was a waiter. So chatting during slow periods, we got talking and started dating. And then I decided, you know, hmm, maybe I'll stick around in town. I was originally going to go away to school, but I decided, hmm, maybe I should stick around and see what happens with this. Who was hired first? Who, Who worked there first? I did actually. I started working there when, as a bus girl when I was uh, pretty young. That's why you, that's why you have grit because you spent time in restaurants, right? I think it's a great starting point for many people. Talk about learning about customer feedback and how to make a situation right. I think uh, restaurant work is really, really a good place to start. Did you wash dishes? I never washed dishes, just did the busing and then became a waitress and a hostess. My first job was dishwasher, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> so, you know, it's amazing what working in a restaurant or retail can do for you later on in life. It just teaches you so many things. And anytime I'm, in, anytime we're interviewing or recruiting somebody at Rider Flex that I see where they they spent some years as a hostess or in a restaurant or as a waiter or something, and they worked their way through college doing that, I I know most of the time that that they know how to deal with people. They know how to handle weird situations. All, just all the things it teaches you. So wonderful. Definitely. All right. So when you're going to Creighton, did you know what you wanted to be? Did, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do for a living? Uh, I knew I wanted to make an impact on the world. It, you know, very uh, idealistic, I guess. I actually started out as a sociology major, uh, and I started doing uh, research and statistics for some of the professors through the computer center back then before laptops and everybody having their own PCs. And it was actually one of the sociology professors who helped with many of the statistical research studies 
for other professors said, you know, you should probably be over in the business school. You would be able to make a bigger impact then. Uh, so I actually changed and became a business major and uh, focused on management and organizational development while continuing to really focus on computer skills and programming and management information systems. So uh, that set the course for really loving technology and loving leadership and management and organizations. Were you involved in, on campus? Were you like student body vice president? Were you like, what, what, were you, what were you doing? Did you have some leadership roles in school? Yeah, I did like doing that. I was the president of the International Relations Club, uh, mm -hmm. where we went around the country and did model United Nations. So that was oh, a lot cool. of fun for a kid from Omaha. Very cool. All right. All right. Very nice. All right. So you're going through school. Uh, did you go right into Stanford uh, to get your master's right after, or was there a gap? No, actually, uh, I was in Omaha for a few years. I started right out of college uh, with what was then the telephone company doing technology. It was right at the time of the divestiture of the Bell system. So it was going to be very messy organizational stuff, which I thought sounded like a lot of fun. And I was hired to uh, help create a new computer system, which was also a lot of fun and exciting. So I started doing my master's actually at Creighton since I was still there in Omaha. Oh. Then uh, got pretty close to getting that done. Then we ended up moving. So I didn't complete uh, that one. I was a few hours short, but what was good was I learned that there was a program that the company sponsored where they would send people to what's called the Sloan program, which is a sponsored master's degree program that takes place at the time, either at MIT or at Stanford. So I early on started raising my hand and volunteering saying, I really wanna be chosen for this. And they kind of looked at me and said, well, you know, one person sent maybe every few years so, you know, good luck with that. And you're not even really the level in the business that we usually send. Uh, but 13 years later, after kind of continuing to say, I really wanted to do this and then being able to um, get to the, the level and having the kind of uh, different background and experiences that would lend myself to it, I actually did get chosen to go. Nice. So oh, congratulations. That was a big win for you. So, yeah, so it's, it's more of a mid-career program. You, you really need to have experience under your belt before you go to it. And it ended up being at an interesting time in my life and my family's life. Now, you, you started moving up pretty quickly uh, professionally in your career. And it looks like you, you were asked to uh, move or maybe you were recruited away and then asked to move and move several times. I'm just guessing, right? Walk us through a little bit of that because I know you, you started with, with U.S. West. Um, where. Yeah, walk us, walk us through some of the moves. Was it Denver, Florida, L.A.? Walk us through some of them. Yeah, there were a lot of moves, that's for sure. <laughs> Started out in Omaha, uh, recruited on campus there at Creighton, and really loved uh, working there. Uh, my husband was, uh, uh, he's a retired lawyer, so he was with a, a law firm there. And we decided Colorado was a good place to move, and it was also the company's headquarters. So it made a lot of sense, and he was open, uh, able to open the Denver branch of his Omaha-based law firm. So oh, oh, that nice. worked really well for both of us, and it was a great time. Uh, really enjoyed that. We loved Denver. This is the fourth time, actually, we've moved back. So oh. even though we've lived many places, um, Colorado feels the most like home of any place. Uh, but yes, uh, we were we moved many times in our career. Uh, actually, my son was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis when he was eight years old, and uh, ten days later was when I was offered the opportunity to go to Stanford for the master's program. So it was wow. a rather tumultuous time to have those two things happen so quickly back to back. But we said, okay, this gives us an opportunity as a family to really move someplace, go do that, um, be closer to sea level, which for someone with a lung disease, we thought might be uh, a little bit easier for him, but really to reassess what we wanted to do in life. And uh, it ended up being a very good decision. Mm. Mm, what is, I can't even imagine what that's like when the doctor tells you uh, that that diagnosis is is confirmed. Uh, is that a slow? Is that something that happens over? Hey, we think it might be this, and there's a bunch of testing, or is it just you go in one day and they and they just tell you, and bam, it hits you? I I have no idea. 
Yeah, we didn't know anything about cystic fibrosis before our son's diagnosis either. Uh, he, it, it's actually a genetic disease, so he had it at birth. It had to be uh, the result of both uh, my husband and I having a recessive gene. Uh, it's just that he really didn't show symptoms until he was eight, which is pretty unusual. In the United States, now every state has newborn screening. So most people find out now shortly after birth. We didn't, it was unusual. We didn't find out until he was eight years old. We knew he had some stomach aches, which can also be an indication of cystic fibrosis, but we had absolutely no idea. Took him into his normal pediatrician. She sent us to a specialist and then uh, he was diagnosed. So it was completely out of the blue, no history in either of our families. And they said, oh, by the way, your younger son, who was only three years old at the time, needs to be tested too. Fortunately, he does not have it. I bet that was scary too, taking him in to be tested. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, please no. Woo, it, it was man. wonderful though. They got the test back the same day. They were so responsive, knowing that we didn't want to uh, wait to get the results. Mm. And uh, the thing is though, they said immediately, there's so much hope with this disease that, uh, if you have to have a, a horrible chronic, you know, fatal disease, this is kind of a good one because there's so much hope and the doctors were so right. So shortly after his diagnosis, my husband started volunteering for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation okay. and I have as well. So that's been an ongoing theme in our life for at least the last 25 years. So when this diagnosis, when that happened, where were you working at the time? Who, who I was were working, working for... U.S. West uh, Cellular, actually, it's now Verizon, but uh, I was here in Denver running the Rocky Mountain region for what's now Verizon Wireless. Okay, and your husband was, was, had opened up the, the, the law firm. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so what did that do to your family life then? Did you, uh, did you decide one of you, were, somebody was gonna stay at home or, or were you gonna get like a full-time nanny? I mean, I guess some major decisions right there. Yeah, uh, because we were both working full time and traveling and busy lives, we actually had a nanny before the diagnosis. Okay. And we decided because cystic fibrosis requires a lot of pills and treatment every day, that it would be best if one of us parents stayed home with our sons rather than uh, have a nanny in the mix. And like I said, it was just 10 days uh, difference between the time we were also offered the opportunity to go to Stanford, which happened a few months later because he had to do the application and uh, such. So uh, we actually looked at it and decided, okay, at the time, my insurance was a lot better through US West than his. And that ended up being one of the big determiners on how we decided whose career to follow and who should stay home. So my husband took the amazing step of deciding to ratchet back his career and eventually retiring to take care of our sons. Wow, that that is a major move for you guys. And Bless. I'm guessing I'm guessing cut your cut, cut your household income like almost in half or a major major hit. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Okay. Okay. And then from there, all right. Well, great. I mean, you know, that's awesome that he could do that. Um, does he practice law and today, by the way? They're grown and healthy and doing uh, well now. Uh, yeah. There's been miraculous work in the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. He's on a, a breakthrough uh, drug that was approved by the FDA in 2012. And it really ushered in a whole new category of medicine called precision medicine that you may have heard about now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really took his life expectancies from maybe the early 30s to who knows, probably a normal life expectancy. So he's now a family medicine doctor who's 33 years old. We're just uh, that's, so grateful. That's fantastic. that's fantastic, congratulations. Does your husband practice law now? No, he's retired. He, he's, he's retired, what's he do, play golf all day? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he actually still does a lot of volunteer work for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and, and other charities as well. And uh, continues to just support me so I can do all my crazy career things. That is such a wonderful story that he was, your, your son was diagnosed with that. And then your husband was able to leave his job. You guys raised him. Now he's 30 something years old and he's a doctor. How about that? That's pretty cool. Yeah, what's your, what's your, what, 
Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, and the, the younger ones, you know, you know, 27 and on in his career and doing well, he always, uh, uh, you know, since he was three years old, we were involved in fundraisers or awareness events, whatever it took for cystic fibrosis. So his whole life, he kind of thought cystic fibrosis was just, you know, the other thing we did as a family. It was the family business. Wow. Okay. Um, a bunch of moves in here. Did those boys get moved in high school too, or were you able to keep them in the same high school? I'm just curious. Uh, you know, that's a great question. We actually made the commitment that during the four years of high school, we wouldn't move them. And they are five years apart. So it was two separate chunks of time. We felt high school was especially that time where you really don't want to disrupt it. However, junior high, grade school, yes, they moved a lot. <laughs> great, great decision, I, you know, for the listeners if you have kids coming up, you're trying to, you know, you want to move up in your career. You want to take the opportunities when they come your way. But yeah, I just, I just would encourage anybody listening not to move a high school kid. It's just so tough on them, you know, it is. Um, and, and there'll be other, there'll be other opportunities for you professionally, probably, you know, it's not like it's a one-time deal. So, okay. Oh, that's good. I'm I glad we're they... commuted uh, during ah, each ah. of their, their high school years for at least a, a part of it. So okay. I worked in Seattle for part of uh, one son's high school career, and I actually was in Ireland. So that was kind of a long commute to Denver, but for a portion of that, because we didn't want to move them, so I did the commuting. Wow. Were you like over there 30 days and home 30, or how'd that work when you were doing Ireland? Uh, I wish. No, uh, it, was, it was really just for the last six or seven months. Uh, or actually the, the first six or seven months of that job. And so I, it was about mm, maybe a, a, a week or a long weekend uh, every month. Woo, that's tough. Yeah, you, tough. You, you, how many miles did you put on that year? Do you know? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> okay, well, you're okay. That, that was tough. Lots of, now, back then, what year was that? That was like 05 to 07. We didn't even have video conference, did we? I can't remember. Well, no, not, not a whole lot. We, we actually did have uh, some technology where we could do video conferences, but we mainly spoke by phone. Okay, that's all right. Wow, and your a family's... significant time change. So I would catch them before they went to school in the morning or before I went to bed at night when they were just getting home from school. Wow. All right. Well, you got through all of that, though. Congratulations. So, so now you've had an awesome career. Um, and right now you're currently the CEO of WOW, which is, it's, that stands for Way Out West, right? Wide Out, uh, Wide Open West. Wide Open West. Sorry, my bad. Wide Open West. That's right. Wide Open West. And it's internet, cable, and phone. Give, give, us, the, give us the WOW overview, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, we actually are a provider of, of broadband or internet services along with uh, video and phone services in 19 different markets that are primarily in the Midwest and the Southeast. So uh, we are headquartered here in Denver, but we don't actually have customer operations here in Colorado. It's just a quirk of the history of where the entrepreneur who founded the company wanted to start the company. Uh, but we have major markets like uh, the uh, around the Chicago area, Detroit, uh, Atlanta, and uh, many states throughout the, like I said, the Midwest and the Southeast. So we compete with the likes of Comcast or Charter and really provide our customers excellent service. And in fact, uh, for 2020, we were named Cable Operator of the Year. What? Congratulations. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, very good. So now in Colorado, then your competition is who? TDS and uh, or who, who would be who would your competition be? Because I have a question about this. Yeah, in Colorado, we're just headquartered here. So oh, we really oh, that, don't that, have a competition right. in Colorado. That, that, yeah, but uh, right. across our markets, our prim primary competitors are Comcast and Charter or Spectrum. I see. Can I ask you a question? This is pretty technical, but just, you know, maybe the listeners can relate. So I've switched providers a couple of times for my home office primarily because I wanted to get the quote business account, which is supposed to be, I don't know, faster or whatever. And when I switched, it was faster, but it still fades in and out, drops in and out. Both providers told me, well, listen, we can only do so much because the lines in your town that run through the alley, because we live in the old part of town. It's like, it's, it's really all the lines that run through the alley and all those need to be replaced and blah, blah, blah. So even though I switched provider, both of them are telling me that, only so much can be done. 
What, what, what's your response to that? Does that sound right? Wow. I, I just wish WOW was there so we could knock your socks off. We have <laughs> one gig services and over 95% of our footprint. Uh, so I, all I can say is I just wish you were a WOW customer. It is a pain in the ass. I got to tell you, I, you know, I'll be in a podcast interview like this and all of a sudden the internet will just hang up and I'm just, you know, and I've switched it. I've called them and yeah, anyway. I, One anyway. of the other services we provide that could help you out too is a whole home Wi-Fi service which is a, a terrific device that's a, a mesh network for inside your home that makes sure that you're getting the best speed outside, inside your home, no matter where your, your studio, your office is within your mm -hmm. home. So mm -hmm. that could be something that helps too. Now, is that, is that free if you, if, if, you know, you were a guest on the, on the Rider Flex podcast, is that free for me? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll look into that. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just, just joking around. So your CEO there, how many employees? Uh, we have about 2,000 employees. Wow. Throughout, throughout all of our footprint, not just in Colorado. Is that your biggest responsibility so far in your career, 2,000 employees, CEO? No? No, I think this is kind of a fun size company because we can be very nimble and agile. I know it sounds like a, a pretty decent sized business, but as large operators and cable companies go, we're, we're actually not that big. Um, I've had organizations as large as 18,000 people. Okay. But you want, do you want to grow it to 18,000 people? Is that the plan? Uh, not necessarily. I, I think we have a good size. Uh, the main thing I want us to continue to do is just uh, wow our customers. We talk about being reliable, easy, and pleasantly surprising every time as we connect people to their world. So uh, I wanna make sure that we're doing that. Uh, we always balance the needs of customers, our own people and the investors in all the decisions we make. Very good. How did you get there? Did you get recruited? Did you know somebody? How'd you, how'd you get over there? Uh, I was actually recruited. So uh, hmm. a wonderful friend of mine has a recruiting firm in this industry and uh, she reached out to me and said, this could be a very cool job and a good match. I knew something about the legacy of WOW and its reputation for customer service, which was very attractive to me. Plus, it, uh, at the time we were living in Northern California, it gave me the opportunity to come back to Denver, work with some of my dear friends from the industry, and I, I thought it sounded kind of fun. Okay, very good. All right, publicly traded? Yes. Has the stock gone up since you've been there? It's, it's been volatile. So it's been up and down, just like everybody, especially in the times of COVID. Ooh, you know, being a CEO is a tough on a regular day. How about being a CEO during COVID, right? Like, holy cow, now you got all this other. <laughs> Talk to me. Yes. Yeah. It, you know, there have been good things that have come out of it and definitely some challenges that we're all experiencing in this economy. But one thing, and it really goes back to what you were saying about doing your podcast from home, everybody is using more broadband from home. So that's good for our business. So our broadband sales have continued to just skyrocket as we've helped people uh, work, learn, and be entertained from home. So that's been the good part of it. But certainly the challenges are, as I'm sure what you're seeing too, with small businesses that we want to uh, support that are having trouble even staying in business or moving their model to more online rather than in person. So mm -hmm. we've been very adaptive to all that. We brought all the employees who could work from home home back in mid-March. Uh, but we still have technicians who work out in the field on the network, as well as uh, some who go into customers' homes. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do uh, when everybody can come back to the office? Do you, do you prefer everybody to be in the office if they can, or do you like the remote? What's your, what's your take on that as a CEO? Right, We've been, we do a lot of things to really make sure we're continually listening to our, our people as well as watching how their engagement is and what's happening with productivity. And we've been delighted to see how pleased people are with the model of working from home, whether they're in a call center environment, but doing it from home or our network operations center or the head of marketing. Uh, people are really adapting well to this and we're also very pleased with the productivity that we've seen. So I think we're going to be doing more work from home, certainly than we did before. And that gives us the opportunity to rethink our office space. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good.
So lots of people that listen to this podcast, you know, they want to be, uh, they have some sort of career aspiration. So they come to the podcast for career advice. Let's say there's some listeners out there that maybe they're middle management. They want to, they want to make the, the VP level, uh, the executive level. They're trying really hard to, to move up in their careers. Maybe they even want to be CEO someday. If you had to give them two or three pieces of advice on what it takes to reach the level that you've managed to get to, what would you tell them? Well, I think first of all, I give uh, for my own career so much credit to wonderful mentors that I have had. Uh, people who really took an interest in my career gave me feedback, even if it was difficult feedback, but also made sure that I was put in positions where I could develop and grow, but were also areas that were important to the organization or the business that I was a part of. So I would say making sure that you are open to being mentored, which means being willing to be vulnerable and maybe take a job that is a little bit out of your comfort zone, but allows you the opportunity to really shine. I also think it's especially important if you want to go on and be a general manager, an executive, or a CEO, to take jobs along the way that really have uh, responsibilities that can be measured, especially P&L kind of responsibilities, so you can show your stuff and show the impact that you're making. Mm, that's good advice right there. Uh, how about first-time CEO, once you get to the spot? Uh, first time at CEO, they're calling you and they're like, hey, Teresa, I just got my first CEO uh, position. You say, okay, congratulations. Here's what you need to know. <laughs> what would you say? I would say, first of all, uh, spend as much time as you can listening. Uh, most people, as they get to a senior level, they've gotten there because they were, had an expertise or they had a lot of the answers or the best data but once you get to a very senior levels in the company, you really need to have finely tuned listening skills and be able to ask the right questions to get to the root of, of what the issue is or the question uh, that you're dealing with. I also believe it is critically important to assess the team and get the very best people around you you possibly can. Um, I, I think it's great to have people smarter in different areas than yourself and really rely upon them and make sure they're people who are really uh, willing to have a healthy conflict and discuss things well together. Do you find that, that communication itself is, is the word that just touches so many problems with teams, right? It all just comes back to something is wrong in the communication somewhere. Somebody's not talking or they're, they're having the meetings after the meetings or, or whatever, right? It, it usually comes back to that. Just have healthy conversations and it's okay to have some, some constructive criticism and even some conflict as long as it's done in a professional manner, right? Absolutely. I encourage that so much. Um, our values of our company, we really live every day, are respect, integrity, a spirit of service, and accountability. And we're willing to really make sure that we're confronting each other if we feel like the accountability isn't there or, or uh, whatever it might be, really making sure that we're doing what's best for our people, our customers, and our investors. So absolutely, I don't want people just telling me yes, yes, yes. Uh, your decision was right every time. I want people challenging me mm -hmm. and challenging each other. I think that is absolutely the healthiest uh, way we can be. And that requires people with different backgrounds, different thought process, different expertise. That makes a very healthy environment. I can re remember vividly a moment uh, when I was a CEO for a company and there were a couple of people on the leadership team that had a pretty heated conversation in the conference room about a topic we were trying to make a decision on. And I knew already that they didn't necessarily like each other that much. So there just wasn't very many, you know, they didn't have much in common. So they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, you know, they weren't sending each other Christmas cards or anything. I don't think anyway, they had a, <laughs> they had a pretty healthy debate in that conference room. And then about an hour later, one of them comes over to my office and says, Hey, <clears throat> by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to take Jim to lunch. We're going to go to lunch for a little bit, if that's okay. And I, you know, I thought, you know, that's exactly what, what, what you need, right? <clears throat> you need that ability to, to debate and have conflict, but 
hey, we're still, we're still partners in this thing. And we can still go to lunch and, and it's all going to be okay. We're not going to like be mad at each other like this is junior high or something. Exactly. Focus on the problem, not on the people, right? The issue is the problem that you're trying to solve. And usually when people have, you know, a heated debate about something, you have to love that they're both passionate and really care about it or they wouldn't engage. That's right. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. They wouldn't even be involved. They would just sit there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I always rather have people who feel passionate about the issues at hand and the business than those who are disengaged. Yeah. You can't have that. Do you miss, you know, once you reach the CEO level, it really is like 90% of your job, maybe even 99% of your job really is just people management, right? I mean, you're not really tactically doing anything necessarily uh, besides managing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, most of it is people management. Do you, do you miss actually executing stuff on your own projects on your own because all of your stuff is coaching and mentoring? Well, you know, I, I get the most re, uh, rewarding feeling from my job by developing and mentoring and, and coaching people. So I, I love that. And I love to see how our teams work together. What I, I said about, uh, wow, that is, it's, it's a great size company because we can be so nimble and do things so quickly. So I get to work a lot on the strategy part of the business and how we're going to execute on different things, even if I'm not the one personally doing the executing or closing the sale. Uh, it, it's a nice mix of, of really being able to watch across all the disciplines and try to make sure everybody's continuing to work together. We're on the same page. We're getting so much done because we, we all are clear and aligned on what the goals are. I can still remember when I was a young manager, I had a mentor and I can still remember him walking into my office and he goes, Steve, he goes, do you know the difference between strategy and tactical? And I gave him some, some, some crappy answer. I didn't really, you know, he goes, okay. He goes, sit down for a minute. Let me explain some things to you. Cause, cause I was getting ready to move, you know, from, from tactical into some of the strategy meetings. Right. Um, and uh, so that's why I ask if you missed some of the tactical uh, because you know, so much of it is strategy and people management once you reach your level. Uh, let me ask you this. You've interviewed and hired hundreds and thousands of people at this point, right? I mean, you've, you've done literally probably thousands of interviews, hired hundreds and hundreds. Lots of people that listen to the Rider Flex podcast, they're, they're listening for maybe job interview tips and stuff. Today, in today's world, what are you seeing as the most common mistakes or, or missteps during an interview? Well, one that is unique to our times we're in using Zoom so much. I actually have just recently hired two C-levels and was involved in recruiting a board member all over Zoom. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I think for people who are in the Zoom world, I think it's important to make sure that your computer has the technology you need so that you're uh, ready to go and on time. Uh, that's just a, a basic thing. And, and by the way, no issues with any of those people that I recruited. But, <laughs> uh, you know, just making sure that you know how to get in, you're set up, <clears throat> you've thought about your background. <laughs> yes. Just those little basics to make sure that you're exuding the professionalism you want to um, exude so that you're not distracting your interviewer. So that, that would be one. But I also um, have seen people just not do the research on either the position or the organization. So when it gets to questions, it's clear that they're asking such basic questions. You wonder, why did you even apply for this? So <laughs> those are a couple of things that I've seen people do, even at, at pretty senior levels that surprise me. I'm blown away by both of those. I mean, you know, you know, right effect. So we, we interview people every day, right? You know, that's yeah. what we do for a living. And I'm just blown away by it. I, I, I always think, and my friends will say, well, isn't that common sense? Don't they know to do that? And I, my, I, my answer is, yeah, you would think so, but they don't. <laughs> yeah. So you've seen it too. It, it does. It surprises me. It's like, come on, the details are important. <laughs> I always tell people to your point about the technology, that here's what the listeners really need to understand. It's if, if you spend the first three to five minutes trying to teach them how to connect the right mic or maybe their camera's backwards or whatever, 
or they got, they're looking at a laptop and they're looking you know, the laptop's like looking up their nose or something. If you spend that first three or five minutes doing that with a candidate, it could create negative energy around their profile, even though maybe it shouldn't, but it does because it's just frustrating. So all of a sudden the interviewer has an immediate negative energy vibe about the situation, which could hurt your interview, which is why it's so critical to make sure that stuff is set up ahead of time. You can tell I'm getting passionate as I, as I talk about this because I deal with I this every day. <laughs> right. Well, and I mean, I'm in the broadband, you know, video and phone business too. So it's like, come on, you know, yeah. get it right. That... Yes, I could not agree more. <laughs> um, uh, how about this? Let me ask you this. So you've had such an awesome career moving up into these stressful positions that take a lot of time with two sons, okay, uh, one with cystic fibrosis, and you spend a lot of time volunteering. How, what advice would you give somebody around balancing all of this and having a healthy life, uh, psychologically, physically, emotionally? How do you balance that? Well, uh, you know, I, I I don't know if I've always done it right, but here are a few things that have helped me. Okay. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm necessarily an expert. But first of all, I definitely married right. I married the right person who has been an incredible partner through all of this. And he has definitely helped me with the, the balance of, of work and fun and volunteering and everything. So that, that has worked in my favor for sure. But the, the other thing is, I haven't always worked consistently all those times in a career job. I have actually taken chunks of times off when all I did was volunteering. Mm. So I probably took what would be perceived as some big risks in my career, walking away from a big yes. job because either my son was very sick or the need was so great at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. There was a period of time when our science was outpacing our ability to raise money to fund that science. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a medical researcher, but I do know how to raise money. So there was a period of time where I, I took some time and just did that for them. So it was uh, not doing everything at once, but doing it over a period of time, I had career and volunteer. There are some times when I've had a balance of doing both at the same time, but not always. So that has helped. And I know I have been incredibly fortunate that I've been able to dive back in my career when I wanted to mm. and at jobs that were good jobs. And I, I know that's not always the case. So right. I've been very fortunate. And why was that? Do you, do you uh, contribute that to your networking relationships and people you knew? Or how did you do that? How did you jump back in so quickly? I think that's exactly right. It, I have always, even when I was doing the volunteer work for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, I kept my finger on the pulse of what was happening in the industry mm -hmm. or with business and management. So I never stayed too far away. So I tried to stay current. But clearly, I think uh, the biggest thing was making sure that my uh, network was still there and knew what I wanted to do and, you know, aspirations. So that helped a lot. There's no question. The, the most rewarding thing in a career are, is a, the relationships that you develop with people along the way. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that I have relationships with people because I want to get the next job. It's that these are, are true friends and, and mentors that I, I, I want to have as uh, relationships in my life always. You know, if I can just, if I can just vent here for a minute on, on this topic, you know, so often we will get a, a former VP or maybe an executive that lost their job, got laid off, whatever, they're in between jobs. They're talking to us, Rider Flex, trying to find, you know, their next gig. And I always tell them, you know, listen, John, I, I see on your LinkedIn profile, you have like 58 connections and nobody's, you're not, you're not involved in social media. You don't have any friends professionally. Uh, you know, I think what happens is <clears throat> I think if you're really good tactically at your job and you've, you've been in it for maybe 10 years, you start thinking you're safe. You start thinking, I, I work hard. I'm super smart. I've been in this company for 10 years. I don't need to network. I don't need to have relationships. I don't need to shake hands and kiss babies and make sure that I'm, 
you know, learning things from other people. So you don't spend any time on it. Then you call me, RiderFlex, and you're like, oh my God, I'm unemployed, please help me. And I always wanna just take those guys and just say, listen, you, the last 10 years, you didn't do any networking. Like, where's all your friends? Where's all your professional connections? Like, you have to invest time in that. So for the people listening to this podcast, it's not just about working hard. It's not just about having a high IQ. If you have both of those, great, that's awesome. But you better have good people skills, you better network, you better have relationships and take care of your friends because it will make a difference for you in your career. <laughs> I could not agree more. That is absolutely the case. And it makes for fulfilling life too. Yes, uh, yes. We, we all spend so much time working. I mean, I, a lot of my friends are through work. There's no yes. question about that. Yes. Not, and by the way, those same people can help you personally. I mean, what, maybe you're no going question. through some, some personal struggles. Maybe you want to talk to somebody about what it's like to do a relocation. Maybe you're having problems at home with your marriage, whatever. These are friends you can call in the, in the tough times, in the dark times, and it really does make a difference. A perfect example, a friend of mine, he's a business network friend, right? And we've been friends for a long time. Usually we just talk about business and what it's like, you know, how's your margins this month or whatever we're talking about, right? But when he went through a divorce and his wife, you know, uh, left, guess what? He stayed at our house for several days, you know, and we helped him through that emotionally. And so, yeah, it, it really, it's very rewarding to build these relationships. I feel myself getting passionate about this topic too, because I really get frustrated at people that don't manage this part of their life properly. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I completely agree. When my son was diagnosed, the team that I worked with back then, 25 years ago, um, they absolutely carried me and supported me so much during that period of time. And interestingly, some of them I, you know, because they're, they're good at their jobs too, but they're also wonderful people are working with me now at WOW. See, exactly. This is <laughs> how it, those yeah. kind of relationships, they're, they're practically family. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So two, let me, I know we're almost out of time. I'm going to ask you a couple of more questions. So I'm just curious, have you ever thought about, you mentioned your husband, you're like, make sure you marry right. Have you ever thought? Or have a partner. Like, yeah, I mean, if not yeah, married, yeah, just have yeah, a, a partner, yeah. a support person or support network in your life. Have you ever thought, what was the name of that little restaurant, by the way, you and him both it's worked called, at? It's still there. It's called Trini's in the Old Market in Omaha. Trini's? It's a little Mexican restaurant. Have you ever thought to yourself, if you had not gone in there and interviewed for that job that day, isn't it interesting in life how just one little turn left or right in your day ends up building this entire path. Isn't that fascinating? There's no question about it. Something, something guided you to that specific restaurant. And for whatever reason, it was meant to be that manager said, okay, I like Teresa. I'm going to hire her. All of that had to happen for you to meet your husband, which yeah. is, which is great. Yeah. I love that. I love that I story. I was 15 when I started working there. I had to get a work permit. So <laughs> I worked there for a couple of years before I met him. Wow. Um, when you guys are back in town, have you, have you stopped by there now later in life? That's so yeah. cool. That's so cool. I love that. Uh, if you had to call the 16 year old, if you could call your 16 year old self at this stage in life, knowing what you know now, would you tell her anything specific? Uh, I would say um, continue to trust your gut that in your instincts, uh, but also know that uh, you can't control every, everything that happens, but that's okay. There are times something happened where I thought, oh no, I didn't want to, you know, not get that job or not get this or, you know, whatever happened, but it ended up being the best thing ever. That then I just couldn't see it at the time that maybe not getting that opportunity or having this happen or that happen would end up being so fulfilling in life. So it, it's easy when you're young to think, oh, I have a plan. I'm not going to divert from it. I'm going to control all these things that happen. But being open to the possibilities sometimes makes so much better happen and not to get too wound up in it uh, because sometimes you can't even tell until a few years later That's right. that that thing that didn't happen or did happen to you actually ended up bringing on something that was much, much better and maybe where you're supposed to be. Perfect example of that is, is I can use myself. I was fired 
as a district manager for a retail company uh, one day uh, over some stuff I, I won't get into, but I remember thinking, oh my God, my life's over. Like, I can't believe it. I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to move up. I wanted to be this. I wanted to be that. Like, I can't believe this has happened. That ended up opening some doors for me to go into wholesale outside of retail. All of a sudden, I moved over into wholesale and advancing into an executive position, which really just ended up balancing out my portfolio, right, in my resume, because I wouldn't have had the wholesale and I wouldn't have had the executive. Okay. So it all, to your point, it usually happens for a reason. If you'll just, if you'll just stay positive and keep charging forward, usually it'll work out just fine. <laughs> and, and I can't, it, it sounds like we have a similar philosophy on this. I am a very optimistic person and uh, continue to have hope and belief and uh, loving what you're doing. Those things really get you through most any times. Yep. Um, one last question. If you had to put your core purpose in life into a sentence, what would that sound like today? Hmm. Well, for my job as WOW, so I won't, you know, go into the whole, whole life, but for my job at WOW, it really is uh, continuing to delight my customers, our people, and our investors. And every day I wake up with the, the thoughts of those three constituencies and how I balance everything that we're doing for all of them. Uh, it bigger in life, I guess, than that. It really is about my family and the work we've done with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And uh, kind of back to what I said when you asked what I wanted to do in college, and that is, I just hope that I've made a positive impact on the world. You have, you have, my friend, and you, and you still are every day. <laughs> Very kind, you thank still, you. you. You still are. Congratulations on your career and everything that you have done. Really cool story. Um, I wish uh, I may follow up with you on that that stuff you mentioned that I can get from Wow to help my my uh, wireless here at the house. I may follow up with you on that. Okay, sounds good. I I'm still a little person at heart, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's pretty good. I appreciate you being on the Riderflex podcast, Teresa. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. If you think today's tip or guest interview can help someone you know, please share this with them. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to our channel and hit the like button. If you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to hit that little bell next to the subscribe button so you can be notified when we release a new episode. Our show features entrepreneurs, business executives, and the stories behind how they got there as well as daily tips on career advice and job interviews. You can visit riderflex.com to learn more about us and get information on the recruiting and consulting services we provide. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.